and there's somebody in the door, I'm gonna let them in. I'm gonna disable the waiting room so that everyone could be able to come in. I'm just waiting on, okay, uh, Twitter is fine. All right, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to HGJ.tax. So we do these live streams every week where we talk about uh, taxation, residency, citizenship. If you want to see what's coming up next, have a look at HGJ.tax forward slash events. Uh, today, we're also, we, we have the, the privilege of two very distinguished and qualified professionals from St. Lucia who are going to talk to us about all things St. Lucia. We're also going to have some giveaways. So for those who may be seeing this, if you comment below and tick it, below whichever platform you're going to be looking at us at, just comment, tick it, because we have our in-person conference in, at the end of January in Portugal. So if you want to attend, please let us know. But all the details are on hg.tax forward slash events. Now, we're going to be mentioning some things about the world of taxation. As qualified professionals, you know how it goes. Nothing we say here should be construed as advice. We're going to have a general conversation about general principles. If it is that you need uh, counsel about your specific situation, you need to engage a professional that's qualified in the jurisdictions in which you're exposed, and that'd be the only person who could give you advice. So... We're not giving tax advice. We have what we're hoping that you walk away with are some key ideas and principles that you want to take to your preferred advisors. So, without any further ado, I introduce you to Jeffrey and Keith. Hey guys, would you like to introduce yourselves? Thanks a lot for that, Darren, and thanks for thanks for the the privilege for being part of this event today. Um, you know, Darren and I have known each other for a long time, albeit at a distance. He visited us quite a number of years ago where, when, when, when I had less gray hairs than I actually do now. <laughs> um, and it's been nice to, to sort of see, you, you know, the beauty of the virtual space is seeing, seeing people's progression and their trajectory over the years. And it's been nice to, um, to, 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 see, to see the movement of your profession and how you've developed that. You know, kudos to you for what you've done. And, and and that was what really prompted us to reach out to Darren and to engage him and see how we can collaborate um, on, on, on creating a space for a discussion, um, bearing in mind, you know, the position that St. Lucia now sits in um, globally and, and how we've been able to, to, to take advantage of, you know, a lot of things St. Lucia to, and, and the government has has provided a, a sort of a legislative background and, and, and underpinning that has allowed us to attract foreign direct investment, particularly by you know extending economic citizenship. So so just by way of a just by way of introduction on on ourselves and our law firm, I'm the managing partner of a law firm in Saint Lucia called Flo de Bulle and Thomas. Um, we're one of the biggest and 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 most experienced and oldest law firms in Saint Lucia. Um, we have a very diverse practice and um, mainly in the space of banking and finance, um, civil litigation and so forth. So, so, so we consider ourselves a, a one-stop shop, anything civil, um, conveyancing and property and so forth. And, you know, the last few years we saw an opportunity for us to, to um, enter into the CBI space when St. Lucia launched in 2015, 2016. And from since then, we were one of the first um, to obtain a license and have been in the space for quite a while. We have some really solid promoters um, that we work alongside with all, all corners of the, of the world, offering and, and successfully assisting clients from, from every part of the world, from the US to, to China and everything in between. So in a nutshell, that's who we are. Um, here with me is, is, is our colleague, is, is my colleague Keith, who is the um, chief operations officer of our dedicated CBI firm, Polaris. So I'll hand you over to Keith to give you an introduction. Keith, you're on mute. You just need to unmute yourself. Uh, well, no, well. 
Okay. Seems to be some sort of technical difficulty, Keith. So here on Zoom, I can see that your mic is open, but for some reason, we're not hearing you. Let's see. Kind of strange because we just were speaking, right? Did you change mics? Okay. All right. Uh, Is this any better? Yes. Now we can ah, hear you. There Fantastic. We go. Welcome. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Darren, I was enjoying not hearing Keith for a while. <laughs> all, all good things must come to an end, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, again, I was just saying good morning or good evening or good night to everyone who's listening. As Jeffrey indicated, I am an attorney in St. Lucia at the firm, but Primarily, I'm the chief operating officer of our citizenship by investment entity. So I've personally dealt with and our firm, we've dealt with over 100 clients actually over the last few years or so from all around the world, from places as close to us as the US and places as unexpected as Mongolia. <laughs> so we have a very rich history of citizenship by investment. We understand the program regionally and we understand you know what clients needs are how it relates to taxation and really what the benefits are for each the unique profiles which we have and there's several and things are constantly changing particularly with covid and you know the war in ukraine the expected recession it's a really beautiful and interesting world out there when it comes to citizenship and how it plays and if taxation, visa-free travel, portfolio management. So that's really what myself and our team do at Polaris. And we, of course, as Jeffrey said, we have the law firm which can assist in any civil matter. So we really are full service law firm in St. Lucia. Fantastic. Thanks for that introduction. So I know that you you made the point that you, you, you're especially careful to mention that you guys are licensed. Both of you mentioned that. And yeah, as a, my perception as an outsider is that things could be, it's sometimes like Wild West, you know, in, in, in terms of there being not much of a regulatory framework. What advantage is there for someone using uh, someone who is licensed by the government of Solutia as opposed to just some random influencer that you saw on TikTok? <laughs> well, what I would say is credibility, expertise, and security. You know, we're licensed, which means that there's a, there is a rigorous process for selection of agents. We do have to renew our license every year. Your performance is reviewed annually. If you're performing poorly or the app complaints about you, you will know about it because it's a lot of money involved. And it's important that we're agents of the country. So our performance reflects directly on the country. So there's a large impetus on us to provide the highest quality of service. And we are regulated. now. In the CBI space generally, one of the issues is there's really not much regulation at all. So I can just say, hey, I'm selling citizenship, just sit in Singapore, have never done this in my life, try to charge you some money to put some documents together to then try to submit it through an agent or directly to the government. What you find with a lot of these people who are fly by night, you have many firms which are either blatantly, unfortunately, taking people's money really for because they have good marketing but no expertise and for them it's hey let's just take funds or you're left in a position where you maybe you did get citizenship but that firm which you worked with that fly by night one day shop so to speak by next year that firm is gone so you have citizenship but you have no link to the island you have no real ideas what the benefits are you have no idea what are the next steps you know so what I think you get particularly from a licensed agent, which is on the ground as well as, like I said, expertise, credibility, but also that long-term quote-unquote family on the ground, so to speak. 
we've been in St. Lucia as a law firm for 60 years. I'm hoping that we can stay here for a lot longer. So once you're done, you continue to have that support. If you need tax plan, if you need, I have clients who are like, hey, can you apply for an American visa for us? So do you know how to get a UAE visa? That sort of thing. You have that support because we're here and we're here to assist you. We don't, we're not just marketing saying, hey, take 147 countries visa free and enjoy the beach. You know, it's a lot more sophisticated than that. So it's always important, I think, to definitely, if you're not going to go with an authorized agent directly, definitely at least with an authorized promoter because these people are, again, regulated. Yeah, th th there's one other thing I would like to add to that, Darren, when we talk about the regulatory framework and, you know, sort of the legislation that underpins the CBI um, offerings in St. Lucia, you know, that, that is something that our government, um, current and past, recognizes the value of that. You know, Keith and I always have the conversation internally about, um, you know, when we see clients and vet them ourselves and we're like, do we want this person to be a citizen on 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 our in our space? And 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 really, that is the litmus test because we recognize as as first of all as agents, secondly as citizens, and and the government does undertakes a similar process. At the end of the day, we have to sell something and promote something that will yield returns decade upon decade and upon decade. And the only way you're going to do that is to have a proper solid compliance and regulatory underpinning. At the end of the day, it makes no sense making a packet of money if it is that you have citizens who ought not to be citizens, because you remember it's by choice. You know, when, when somebody wins this, when somebody gets their citizenship by birth, that is not really by choice. You you are making a positive choice to accept somebody within with with with, with and embrace them in your country so that that is they recognize a, a a serious obligation and duty i mean there are reports at the table in parliament every year and it's something that is that, that is really really scrutinized um the due diligence process is a very rigorous and, and that's why we tell our clients look it may be a little more expensive in some of the instances but remember it's like either buying a casio not knocking a casio or buying a rolex or you know it it it, it you want something that will hold its value and keep its value. And, and, and we've seen that with some of the other global offerings by when they've cut the corners, how you know the, the, the investors have paid the price. Um, that there's one example that comes to mind. Um, so, so that is something that, that we recognize, as I said, the successive governments from 2015, when 2016, when we launched the program up until now, um, if we cut the corners, we're all going to pay the price. Great points, great points. And for those just joining us, uh, we do this every week. Have a look at hdd.taskpod slash events. You'll have the opportunity to meet Jeffrey and Keith in person when we have our in-person event uh, conference in Portugal at the end of January 2023, the Nomad Offshore Summit. So going back to the idea uh, or to the principle of looking for promoters or uh, firms that are not just reputable, but are fully licensed. Uh, St. Lucia, and, and this is another thing that kind of gets to me when I look online and people don't even know how to pronounce the island, you know, they, they're saying all sorts of variations. So St. Lucia, for those who, who don't know how it's pronounced, so St. Lucia is one of five territories or five jurisdictions in, in the Caribbean which offer citizenship by investment. How does, generally speaking, I know this could be a really uh, uh, incredible segue into hours and hours of discussion, but generally speaking, how does the St. Lucia offering differ from the other four? So what I would say, generally the processes are very similar in that we're all part of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. We all have similar mandates and similar needs. What I would say is St. Lucia in regard to the benefits, at least I would say that our program is tailored to a different type of investor, so to speak, than maybe, a, for example, Dominica. So St. Lucia, we found that a lot of our clients are geared towards, at some point, potentially retiring St. Lucia or using St. Lucia as a second base, so to speak in that St. Lucia of the offering islands, we're probably the most geared towards foreign direct investment. And 
because of that, we've really seen in the last few years, massive improvements to our infrastructure on island. So for nomads and people who just want a place that's not in a big city, but where they can work and they can also enjoy, which has good access to Europe, which has good access to the US, Canada, St. Lucia seems to be really popular for them. And I think that's really what we've gotten from a lot of our clients. In regard to price, I think for a single person, St. Lucia is one of the cheaper options. So I think probably until maybe a few weeks ago, St. Lucia is definitely the cheapest for single people across the board. So we had, a, we particularly during the rise of crypto, so to speak, and the height of COVID, we had a lot of young COVID millionaires, particularly from China, particularly from the US as well, getting citizenship. Lots of persons in their mid, sometimes even early 20s. So as people who are still at university, actually, just single people who thought that, hey, at some point, this is going to be beneficial to me. I want this to travel. So I think that's really where we differentiate ourselves and also reputation. So because St. Lucia is the youngest program, we have the benefits of seeing where other programs have, may have stumbled over time, where they have had growing pains, and we've been able to more or less account for these things before they happen. And I think because of that, we've not really had any scandals, so to speak, as of right now. And because we also have less economic citizens, people see some benefit to that. We don't have 10,000 citizens by investment, at least not yet. You know, so it's still somewhat of a niche, which people tend to like for whatever reason. You know, you don't, there's not that benefit of, hey, someone got it in 1980 and my dad got it and my cousin has it, so now I have it. But there's this sort of, it's new, it's young, it's fresh. It's trying to move with the world as it is today. And I think that's really a benefit that, and we try to remain flexible, remain dynamic and to continue to grow and improve with the times. And I think that's where it really stands out. Fantastic, Thank, thanks for sharing that. And again, those who are just joining us, hcj.taskforce slash events for uh, details on our future live streams, as well as our in-person Nomad Offshore Summit at the end of January next year. And if you message us through our website and say St. Lucia, you'll get a chance to win a free ticket to uh, attend the event in Portugal at the end of January. So you mentioned, Keith, that it is quite a rigorous process. So since inception to now, just ballpark how many people you think have taken advantage of citizenship by investment? And typically, how does someone qualify? So what is the profile? You mentioned crypto, but like what are the qualifications that are look that are, you know the government unit is looking for in that ideal citizen? So in terms of numbers, I would say as of right now, probably anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000, I think around that ballpark so far. In regard to the ideal citizen, so the base qualifications, I think they want to ensure that as many people as possible have an opportunity to apply, but as many quote unquote good people as possible. So right off the bat, people who have criminal records for well very serious crimes, Those very minor things aren't really an issue, but quote unquote serious crimes or anything where you would serve jail time in St. Lucia, you're automatically not qualified. Persons who are seen as quote unquote litigationers, so someone who's been sued maybe 20, 30 times, people with that sort of history, who we think can bring disrepute to St. Lucia would be disqualified. And persons who are bankrupt and who are trying to evade taxes and anything that's nefarious. What we want really are good people who can contribute to St. Lucia. I think the ideal citizen for St. Lucia right now are persons who want to come and want to invest in St. Lucia and use their citizenship in a way which initially through their investment to get citizenship benefits St. Lucia, but who can also have a continuous relationship with the island. And our citizenship by investment unit is also working with Invest St. Lucia, which is our investment unit on Ireland, 
and they're trying to constantly find synergies because what they want to promote is what they call beyond the passport where it's not just about visa-free travel. If you are a citizen actually, you're coming to St. Lucia and you let them know, they will ensure that you're well taken care of, they will ask to meet and they're really trying to get people to really invest in St. Lucia, whether that's an active investment or passive investment. I think for them, we they see that we're already geared towards foreign direct investment. And if you're a citizen, why not do more? Why not you know, own a business in St. Lucia? Why not have a stake in some sort of entity in St. Lucia, which will benefit you as well as the rest of the general citizenry? So I think that is really our ideal citizen and what they're really looking for. And we're, they're trying to create programs which will attract these sort of people. So programs or offerings for citizenship, which isn't simply a donation or paying for real estate where you're actually forming some sort of enterprise or you're investing in some sort of joint venture. I think they really want to push that. And that's probably something we're going to see to attract again more of what you would mm. consider the ideal citizen. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Darren, be, before before we move on, sorry, sorry to just jump in there. You know, Keith touched on something that that that, that brought something to the forefront. Um, you know, on our marketing ish, initiatives, we have shown that we have positioned St. Lucia in such a place where we're actually attracting the sort of investors that we want. And I'll, I'll give you a little example. You know, touching on what Keith is saying, the the, the demographics seems to be a wealthier client who actually has um, a keen interest in seeing how their, their investment benefits the country as a whole. I mean, we have two things come to mind and Keith, Keith, will, Keith, Keith will just jump in here. I mean, we have a, a, a director on one of the Ivy League universities in the States, for example, and one of the discussions is, you know, how are, we go, how, how, how are they going to contribute to their, 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 their new country? You know, that's that that's one. We have a senior official from the UN who is, you know, looking around and, and, and looking to move here. And, you know, we have a number of very wealthy um, people who are not just inquiring about and, and processing citizenship on the basis that, oh, yeah, I will get a citizenship. But it's about they, 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 their concerns are about how is my investment going to benefit the country that I am now adopting and or has adopted me in a manner of speaking. And it seems that, that 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 is what I find is the value proposition. The, the other thing about it is that, you know, potential investors also need to look at what the government's policy is on, 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 on global issues. So say, for example, the sanctions in Russia, you know, to the extent that a lot of our trade is done with the U.S., um, you know, we're, we're, we're a four-hour flight away from mainland United States, you know, from Miami, we're we're a direct flight away from London, for example. You know how how are our our governmental policies, you know, aligned with global policies that will not affect the value proposition of this investment that you're going to make, and that is something that you you know the government has very been been very keen on because it's about ensuring that we're all aligned, and and ensuring that you will not be investing in a jurisdiction that may itself become sanctioned because of certain certain decisions that the government is taking on a policy level you know whether on a, on an individual basis you agree with it or not it it's it, it it's immaterial the question is are you going to find yourself in a place where you are now jeopardized because of this investment and and that is something that we always tell the investors to look at you know when you're making your choices look look and see who is aligned in certain ways and who and, and who who, who who is kind of misstepping with global you know policy? Great, thank thank thanks for that that uh, that commentary. It's it's pretty interesting. Now, one thing that strikes me about solution, I think you guys are alluding to it. Of the so they're just just to create context. Uh, so there are five uh, jurisdictions or five islands or five countries in, in the Caribbean which offer citizenship by investment. So I'm from St. Lucia, we have Grenada, Antigua, Barbuda, Dominica, St. Kitts, Nevis, right? Now, St. Lucia, relatively speaking, is probably bigger in terms of population size, uh, at least. So therefore, uh, it's it's less, yes, it is laid back, but not as much as some perhaps of some of the neighboring uh, territories. So whereas 
I've heard comments that, okay, some of the others, I want the citizenship, but if I live there, it might be too boring. St. Lucia, you know, may, may have a, a different value proposition in that, you know, there's so much going on. It, you know, it could be an interesting place for someone who is actually looking for a place to live, that, that second or third jurisdiction, depending on, on how they, they plan their lives. So, so that is interesting. However, on the flip side, taxation so some of the others have relatively simpler tax regimes but of course St. Lucia is not a tax-free jurisdiction but it does have territorial tax so generally speaking income that arises outside of St. Lucia is not taxed but investments in St. Lucia would be taxed how do you comment on the livability of St. Lucia and the tax uh the relative tax appeal of St. Lucia generally speaking You're on mute if you're speaking. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, I mean, generally speaking, yes, you are correct. We we adopt a territorial tax um, tax approach. Um, the, the the thing about it is that, and 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 you know, you okay. Let 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 let's step back for a second and and sort of um, again provide a little more context. You know, we're a independent small island developing state um, that is that is largely dependent on tourism for income. You know, we're competing because of our physical location. We're competing. So say, say mainland Europe, for example, we're competing with, with sort of cheaper options on, 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 the, on the doorstep of, of London, uh, of England and, and France and all the rest of, you know, you know on the rest of Europe. Um, we have to earn money some way. The, the, the thing about it is that we cannot be a zero tax um, jurisdiction as a matter of fact. Um, because, because of our transition from, from what was largely an agri agricultural based economy to a tourism based economy, we've had to, we've had to maintain the tax system. Um, and, and that's where the majority of St. Lucia's um, or, or the government's um, income is derived. There's no way about getting around from that. You know, we have to provide social services to everybody just like anybody else, um, you know, medical security and all the rest of it. And, and so, you know, that is why the government has taken on initiatives like CBI, because that is where you are going to add, um, you know, income into your treasury to fund all of these various things. There's no getting around that. But I will say to you that what is interesting about when you look at St. Lucia as compared to, 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 to what is happening elsewhere, particularly in the wake of the pandemic, is that we've maintained our tax position at the 30%, which is where it's been for a very long time. What has happened though in the last um in the last in the last budget was that there were some changes to increase the threshold. So a lot of people are falling more outside of the tax bracket, and that's because of an analysis that was done um, of 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 um, if you like the what in the the effect of inflation on a large segment of of of, of our of our um, of our population. But what 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 is interesting though, from an investment point of view, is that we have a full suite of fiscal incentives and legislation that facilitates. Um, inbound investment by foreigners and locals alike, where you could get a 15, 10, 15 year tax holiday, um, customs duties exempt on the importation of raw materials and on building supplies. So say, for example, you want to take advantage of what is comparatively speaking, you know, cheaper beachfront lands, um, you know, and you want to build um, a, a, a small, because there, there are, there, there are, um, options available for different scales of development. You can basically do this with no taxation, you know, and avail yourself of a very simple application process once you have the capital to inject. Um, so, so yes, there is, there, there is this, this tax regime at, at 30%, but there are these options available for people who have capital or who have access to capital to invest and actually basically um, you know, propel the country in a certain way, um, you know, and not pay any taxes for 10 or 15 years once their once their investment is to a certain level. Thank you for that. Uh, Keith, do you want to comment or? Uh, yeah, just on to actually um, 
piggyback a bit on Jeffrey was saying in regard to um, taxation. So additionally, in the recent times, they've started this, well, from an existing concept called economic substance, wherein more or less major companies, if you have certain quote unquote economic substance, so you may have a head office in St. Lucia, for example, and enough operations in St. Lucia, you're more or less tax exempt. And I think the benefit of that is, so for example, we have a few regional banks, their head office is actually in St. Lucia because they want to benefit from that tax exemption. When you do that, you're bringing in maybe your CEO, you're bringing in your high level people. These people are coming and they're also contributing to the economy. Now we have a very large population of expats in St. Lucia. Because of that, that drives livability because the more quote unquote high level, high level people you have in your island, the better housing you want in your island. You know, so now we have what is really a world class marina in St. Lucia. We have a really good golf course. Another one is being built by um, Cabot, which is supposed to be one of the best golf courses in the world when it's done, which should be in about a year or two. So because of that, and because of the money we're generating from all our programs, we're not saying, hey, come and just be tax exempt. We're telling you, yes, there are taxes, but if you invest in St. Lucia to make it better, we will invest in you and we will make things easier for you. And that then drives the economy, that then drives infrastructure, that then drives livability, that just drives more people to the island. And you have this continuous cycle, or what should definitely be a continuous cycle of growth and expansion of our economy, which will again improve livability and get more and more people and more foreign direct investment and more income and revenue to the island. And I think that's really worked well in the last few years. And which is why I think our transition from agriculture to tourism has been a really massive success, at least in my opinion. I think in the Caribbean, also as someone who's lived in London for a long amount of time, who's traveled to Europe, to the UAE, to Asia, I think for livability, yes, we're not Dubai. We don't want to be Dubai, but um, I think we're definitely a good mix of, you know, sea, sun, sand, but also good infrastructure, good internet, good options to eat, good access. I think we really have a bit of everything. And Honestly, I think St. Lucia is livable for almost any profile of person. Mm. Great. Thank, thanks. Thanks a lot. For those who are just joining, uh, we do these live streams every week, hg.tax forward slash events. If you visit our website and you comment through one of the, the chat portals, uh, St. Lucia, you can win a chance to uh, attend our Nomad Offshore Summit at the end of January and have a conversation with Jeffrey and Keith in person and talk more about the, the St. Lucia advantage. Now, to, to your point, absolutely, the livability of St. Lucia does stand out. You know, the, the festivals, the jazz, the carnival, the, you know, the nightlife, is, there's a buzz to it, unlike some of the, the, the smaller, quieter islands. And the, you know, uh, as a result of that, the investment opportunities. And, and again, just to create context, so my understanding, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you can apply for citizenship based on a $100,000 donation to the National Economic Fund fund, real estate for 300000 buying 250000 in government bonds, or investing a million in local enterprise. Now, in terms of that real estate option, somehow real estate as a vehicle for citizenship by investment has come under criticism by certain influencers online. Uh, you know, they say it's not value for money, it's hard to get rid of it, it's overpriced, the yield is not there. What are, you, what are your comments? What are your thoughts on that, the real estate option? So I think it's a bit of a difficult, well, situation when it comes to real estate. So in the Caribbean, I think what the issue historically has been is we've had generally across the region a fair amount of white elephants, so to speak. So projects which started and they don't finish, you know, and I think there have been some really good projects. So I think Secret Bay, for example, in Dominica, I think they recently announced that they've given had over a million dollars in re US in returns to investors recently. I think, you know, um, Kapinski is another beautiful property in Dominica. And I was actually in Dominica less than a month ago and I had the 
pleasure of seeing what that is, you know? So I think real estate can be a good vehicle. I think like anything else, you need to be discerning when it comes to making that investment. I think it would be a bit naive to think that, hey, you're just going to have a guaranteed return. I don't think that's, that just from an investment perspective, generally, that very rarely happens in anything, you know? So you need to look at, hey, what is being built? If it's not yet completed, what is the feasibility of what these people are trying to do, you know? And then take a real hard and educated look at what that specific project is. Because I think, again, for every white elephant, which didn't finish, you have a few gems like the Kapinski and Dominica, like Secret Bay, as I said. I think Range Developments, they're doing really good work across the region. And all of their, all of their developments have either finished or are set to finish. I think in St. Lucia, Galaxy, it's not yet done. But I'm just, you know, looking at where they're going, I think what they want to do should be a really beautiful resort, which can hopefully get returns. But again, these developments are all by private developers. So you need to be discerning, you need to look at your investment. And generally, if you're just looking, if you're just like, hey, I, if you don't want to really think about it, don't go the real estate route. You know, because it is an investment and like every investment, there is risk. So anyone who's telling you, hey, just spend 300000 you're going to have a guaranteed return. And after the five-year holding period, you're guaranteed to make your money back. That person is probably lying to you. But if there's someone who tells you, hey, this is what we have. These are our projections. We think in five years, the way the market is going, if things go this way, you can do this. Then that's the discussion you need to have on a case-by-case -case basis. But I do think real estate can be a good avenue. And I think from a the perspective of the country, the CBI real estate can be very beneficial because it attracts it attracts not only more foreign direct investment and tourism, but also creates more jobs for the local economy. So I think there's definitely something there. I just think that people need to be more discerning and also governments need to take steps to ensure that these, these developers are well regulated, that these properties are built because that's the only way you're going to move the stigma away from real estate in the Caribbean by having a track record of consistently good completed projects, which may not all give you the return you want, but which when you, when all things considered, everything was well regulated, everything, there was a system that everyone was accredited. I think that's really important. But 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 Darren, I'd like to hear your view on this because obviously, I mean, it's it there, there, there's there's a bit of it out there, you know, in in the virtual space. I mean, I have my own personal views about you know investors being a little more discerning, and and exploring and prodding, asking the right questions, and ensuring that it's also aligned with their investment and their portfolios and what their expectation is. But I'd like to hear it from you know so, sort of hear your perspective on it because at the end of the day, it's it's still a a general business proposal. And I mean, there's only that the, what is slightly different. This is not a pure um, real estate investment. There's that there's this added, you know, icing on the cake, which is which is the citizenship. I, I think you know I agree with with Keith's uh, you know point of view, and I, I think not just with CBI, but just personal finance in general there is there's a problem there's a problem and we saw it come to a head a, a, a couple of weeks ago with ftx in a not in a neighboring caribbean jurisdiction so you you have a, a ftx and, and other not just i'm not going to pick on ftx but other investment opportunities where you have influences in the space and who may not be from a, a finance background but they are trying to promote these investment opportunities. And perhaps, you know, they're sometimes subject to a little bit of an exaggeration in, in terms of their sales, sales pitch. It just lends itself to problems and it lends itself to problems. So whether it's real estate or uh, crypto or, you know, a, a personal finance course, whatever the case may be, if anybody is promising you that you will be wealthy and you're gonna be a millionaire and you will get a return Obviously, you know, 
it, it's probably not true. And, and you see it in, in stark contrast to you know, influencers and analysts who are properly qualified and credentialed for what they do. They never make recommendations because they understand that of course, there's always an element of risk and everybody's risk profile and everybody's personal goals, financial goals are gonna be completely different. So they're not gonna come on at a platform and speak generally, but unfortunately as a result of their, of their prudence and, and their conservative approach, they don't tend to attract as much visibility as that guy or lady or whoever is going to be on a platform shouting, you're going to be rich, you're going to be rich like me, here's my whatever, uh, by buying this or investing in whatever it is I'm being paid to promote today. So, uh, so yeah, I think it comes down to caveat emptor, buyer beware, do your due diligence and make your own decisions. And that's just the way it is. All right. Okay, so... Moving, moving away from, from the, the, the real estate stuff, again, another simplistic way of looking at citizenship. For me, this is my perspective. You can tell me if, if you guys agree. A somewhat naive and simplistic way of looking at CBI options would be having a table that says, well, this is the number of visa-free countries you're going to get. And therefore, because this country gives you more, automatically it ranks higher than ones that give you less. So what do you think of that ranking system? And, and what do you think about St. Lucia's uh, place in that overall spectrum, this whole thing about visa-free uh, travel options? So I think that trying to sell citizenship strictly based on differences in the visa-free options is a very simplistic way to look at it in that to be honest with you, most of the Eastern Caribbean countries have almost the exact same visa-free access. So St. Lucia has 147 countries visa-free as of right now. I think the country of the most probably has either 154 or 156. Now, when you look at these differences, the countries which are there, you're probably never going to go to these countries. You know, I think for the most part, there's a core list of countries which people look at. So generally, the average person from, for example, maybe Syria or Pakistan, they're looking for visa-free access generally to Europe or the Schengen zone and Britain. And they're also looking for easier pathways to get in a US visa. So most of the Caribbean islands, we're afforded 10 year US visas. The process is fairly simple. While in some of these places, it may take them six months to a year to get a visa, which in some cases may last only six months and maybe a single entry. You know, I think, for the most part, we offer the same core suite of countries, so to speak. I think different, a few countries have a few additional benefits. So there are countries which have visa free to China. So if you're a businessman and you're a manufacturer, and that's important for you, then obviously look at a country which has visa free to China. Some countries have visa free to Russia. So if that's a big part of your market, then you can look at that. For St. Lucia, what we have with some of the other islands we have is we have visa free to Taiwan and a very strong relationship with Taiwan. So what we've seen is right now, a lot of Taiwanese citizens, they're interested in citizenship in St. Lucia because they're like, hey, St. Lucia and Taiwan have very strong diplomatic relations. Actually, our prime minister landed in Taiwan today, I believe, or yesterday for his first official visit since assuming office. And Taiwan gives grants, they, there's a big embassy in St. Lucia. So that's what the benefit is for us. But these are of course niches which will not apply to everyone. You know, so again, it's really looking at your personal circumstances. If you're just looking at generally the obvious, so Schengen zone, options to get a visa to the US, Canada, then you can really look at any option. While it's, whilst if you're looking at places like Taiwan, or, China or Russia, then you probably want to be a bit more discerning from country to country. But apart from that, all of the islands, we have Hong Kong, we have Singapore, you know, so there's not really many differences there. And I think that you need to, we all need to look deeper than that. And I think that's what, why we, we're also, our current marketing is beyond the passport. Because again, similarly to tourism, if you think of visa free, it's all just sun, sea, and sand, you know? If you just look at it, you know, from a very macro perspective, we all have nice beaches, we're all island, it's sunny most of the year, 
You could sit on the beach and drink a pina, pina colada, you know? It's really the same thing if you just look at it from that perspective. But when you zone in, for certain investors, there's going to be these little differences which will matter for some people, but it won't matter at all for many people. But 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 Keith, post-pandemic and also um, after the sort of an unrest and the change in the government in the US, we did see a difference in the profile of the applicants. Be, and, and and it was not it was not at its core um, what would historically be a, a sort of a visa unrestricted access um, consideration. We we saw a lot of that, and I think we're still seeing quite a bit of that. Yeah. So at one point, more than thirty percent of our onboarded clients were either Americans living in the U.S. or persons who may be American but they live in Malaysia or Hong Kong. A lot of expats who. You know, with the pandemic and with all the unrest in the U.S., they found that being simply an American citizen was not beneficial. I think at one point in regard to travel, a U.S. passport would probably get you to less places than a St. Lucian passport. And to passports which have very low rankings in the world, you know, so I think that was a real eye opener for people. And then I think at that point also. Not only was there unrest, but you had all this talk about wealth taxes, you know, because of the pandemic. And then people were like, hey, if I don't want, if I, I don't need to live in the US because now I'm working from home, I can live anywhere. I'm still as productive working from home. Maybe I worked for a few months in Asia. I want to stay here. It's cheaper for me to stay anywhere, enjoy this standard of living and this lifestyle more than the US. Why go back, you know? And I think at that point, what you saw is they had a record number of renunciations in the U.S. And I think the last two years, that just increased. And they, they think it's going to keep increasing because the pandemic really opened people's eyes because now you're not just focused on work. You're seeing, you know, people start looking at things differently. So before the pandemic, very rarely would you see Americans, Europeans even thinking about citizenship by investment. And now we have quite a bit. We have lots of Germans. We have quite a few French people. We actually have some American clients who came to St. Lucia on Friday, who I should be meeting tomorrow. So I think we've really seen that shift since the pandemic. And visa-free has really not been much of an issue because these people already have visa-free as well. You see, and Darren, that's, that's where, that's where the, adopting the territorial-based model of taxation really helps because we have such good livability strong infrastructure like with the internet for example and also um you know having we, we have an international school based on the canadian model and and also having a lot of the facilities and amenities um what we've found um is that because there is no taxation on the foreign source income that people figure, you know, it's a really good option for them to work virtually. And we've had quite a few, quite a few people moving their families down here and 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 sort of living living the Caribbean lifestyle, if you like, without having without having to pay the taxes and so on. So you, you know, it, as I said, the value proposition, and that's what the pandemic actually did help us in that regard because it opened up a lot of people's eyes. They wanted an alternative, less risky alternative. Um, that, that, that would facilitate, you know, a, a, a good lifestyle and a good quality of life, because obviously you're not going to compare with the standard of living. You, you, you can, but it's going to be a lot more expensive, but a very good quality of life while still maintaining their ability to earn and, and not be not not be faced with, with, with additional taxes. So, I mean, that, that, was, that, that was pretty interesting. And as I said, more and more people are recognizing that because of our, our strong political um, you know, sort of stability over 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 the entire period of our independence. They're seeing it based on all the uncertainty that's going on in the world. And if you like, what if if you have to adopt, you know, Russia's stance as a proxy war in in, in Ukraine and all the rest, they're seeing this as a pretty safe place to be. You know, we're we're very small, so nobody's paying any attention to us. Um, you know, apart from the waves battering on the on, on the beaches and the cliffs, but. I mean, and, and and that seems to be what the profile of, of the applicants and the and the interested parties are now. 
Yeah, I think the two points that kind of like popped out from what you guys were saying. First of all, the internet. So that is something, I mean, that cannot be overemphasized. So many jurisdictions, you know, you may take it for granted where you are in North America and Europe, but a lot of jurisdictions have internet connectivity issues, including certain Caribbean islands, including the UAE, because as anyone who's lived in the UAE, like I have, uh, there's a huge problem with VPNs. So certain American platforms that you take for granted, like WhatsApp and stuff, they're really hard to use without a VPN. And even with the VPN, it's a, it's like a moving target. You, you're playing cat and mouse with the government. So I, you know, I had a client who was going to move to the UAE, but because she runs an IT uh, company, she didn't move because she needs unencumbered access to certain US platforms, which you can get. So that, that, that internet piece is, is super important. And then the other, the other point that you guys raise is the, you know, a lot came out of the, the recent pandemic, you know, before many people, their plan B from North America was uh, Australia, New Zealand. And then you had a situation, I remember the hydrogen pandemic, you had nearly like half a million Australian citizens who could not return to Australia. Or who can leave Australia. So the borders closed. New Zealand never fully closed, but it was still not easy to get in and out. So suddenly for people who for whom that was their plan B, their plan B was taken away from them because they couldn't go or they couldn't come or whatever the situation is. So I think the new plan B is to have multiple plan Bs. <laughs> Basically, given you know the uncertainty, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know the next time because we live in an uncertain world. And this, I think only someone who's naive thinks that this could not happen again. It may. And you want the ability to, to move. You know, if things get too uncomfortable for your liking in whichever jurisdiction you are, you want the alternative. You want to go somewhere else and, and perhaps enjoy a little bit more space during the, the lockdown or, or whatever. And uh, a more scenic view, access to nature, fresh air, things like that. So yeah, it, it, things have, have really, I think perspectives have changed and the whole narrative around uh, uh, second citizenships and, and residencies has evolved as a result of, of what we all experience. Now, having said that, the contradiction is that certain OECD countries are becoming vociferous with their discomfort with CBI initiatives. So particularly the Europeans, I believe the Americans don't like it either, but they kind of, they haven't been too overt with that, but definitely the Europeans have been at the forefront uh, of critiquing them. And they found, you know, obviously there were certain irregularities, but even before the irregularities with Cyprus, they were against it. And now we have legal action against Malta with Malta is basically the last man standing in Europe. And uh, my, my thinking is that once they have their house in order, then they will look outwards. And, you know, for example, we saw what happened with Vanuatu, losing access to certain, you know, jurisdictions that they could have entered visa-free. My concern is that that uh, perspective would be expanded and they would target CBI programs in general. What are your thoughts on that? Go ahead, I, think go ahead, that, I think that you are correct that at some point they are probably going to target our jurisdictions. I think that unfortunately we're generally painted with the same brush, you know, and I think that they have had issues with Cyprus, like you said, with Vanuatu, but when it comes to the CB, CBI in the Caribbean generally, I think we're very re well regulated. I think that of course, you're not going to quote unquote catch every bad apple because there's this, you know, there's this train of thought where some countries they expect you to more or less know someone as a criminal before they're actually a criminal. You're not going to, someone can become a citizen, be a fine person, and then five years later do perform atrocious deeds. And that's just the reality. All you can do is due diligence today. And I think that the Caribbean region. St. Lucia particularly, Grenada as well, I think they've done a really good job because we want good citizens. You know, if you don't have good citizens and you keep you let in persons which are on Interpol wanted list, who are sanctioned, for example, you really just have, you know, a house of cards which will fall. So maybe today you're going to make some money by 
get an extra persons in quicker, but in the long term, that's not sustainable. I think the issue with the OECD is they look at things very much from a tax perspective. So for them, the more persons who get citizenship and who have options, that's tax revenue away from them, you know, which I think is very unfortunate because the CBI, particularly in some of the even smaller islands like St. Kitts and Dominica, the CBI has done so much for the economy and in some ways has been very transformational, you know. But I think that the next year or two is going to be extremely important for our industry. I think that right now there's a lot of lobbying taking place, particularly in Brussels. I think that with what's happened in Vanuatu in particularly, what's happening in Ukraine, that's surprising enough brought an additional spotlight on CBI since whether or not you should accept Russian citizens and persons from Belarus, that's become, that's become a bit of an issue. And also the risk in, you know, what do banks think of CBI? That's also become a whole other issue in itself. So I think the next two years are going to be particularly important. But I think the Caribbean region, what we're doing generally is very much fit for purpose. I think our programs are robust. I think that all the jurisdictions, they want good persons as citizens and that they do do enough due diligence, definitely. And that we do this every day. I can tell you the number of documents, how rigorous it is. The sort of questions we get back from the unit for our applicants and the level of details they go into. I think the programs are fit for purpose, but as I think we saw with um, our offshore sector and other industries like agriculture and World Trade Organization, it's very difficult, unfortunately, sometimes to please these superpowers. And in many ways, we're just a dot of very little influence. But I think the next two years or so will be very influential and important for the industry. Yeah, I, um, you know, Darren, we could have a we could have a whole series on that topic. Um, you know, I, I personally have a difficulty with it. I, I understand and I, I appreciate and I respect the concerns. There is no, I have no personal difficulty with that. What I do have is a is a difficulty with how the policy is being framed um, without any parameters set. I mean, most of most of these, you know, going beyond the EU, look at the US, they all have some sort of investment program that, that brings you to um, ultimately um, getting citizenship. That That is the truth and the reality. I think so at the core, what it should be, should be a minimum standard on due diligence. For example, there must be some policy that is rolled out on a very high level that must be some subscription. It could form the framework of some international treaty or, or some agreement where there is some, some high level regulation. But I think to just without more, just if you like, um, apply the big stick simply for the reason that you have an RCBI program is not good enough. And I think that, um, you know, taking that stance is unfair and unjust, inequitable, um, without delving into the mechanics of each and, and taking each case on its own facts and on its own merits. Um, you cannot compare one jurisdiction to the other because of the policy. You cannot compare one jurisdiction to the other because of, you know, the the, the level of due diligence that it might might um, apply. But you're wanting to apply a broad brush across across every program simply on the basis that you have an RCBI program and nothing more. There's no merit in investigating each one. So as I said, I mean, we we could go on ad infinitum on this one, but I do find that it's core. Without more, it's unjust and and in, and, and and unfair, quite honestly. Absolutely, and and in the case of Malta, which of course is facing legal action from from Brussels, they not just have one uh, service provider providing due diligence; they actually require two. So you know, it's like double. Yet still, the the sentiment is what it is. And then recently, we've had uh, one of the the government ministers in Portugal who has hinted 
that the golden visa may be reviewed and come and come to an end, uh, regardless of how much billions of euros it's contributed to to Portugal. So the, yeah, it's I mean it's it's crystal clear that the powers that be have a perspective, and you know it is what it is. And and it's it's interesting that you you drew that historical perspective. Because yes, there was agriculture, there was the Lomé Convention, and the bananas had preferential access. Then there was the offshore sector, and that went its own way. And now we have CBI, and you know, maybe, maybe not. And yeah, I, I guess the the question, perhaps, and you know, for another time, would be what's next for for solution the other four. But with that in mind, we've come to the end. It's it's been an hour. Appreciate your your time and, and sharing your insights and your perspective. Uh, thank you to Ilio. I saw your comments on LinkedIn. So we had some people watching us on LinkedIn and Facebook. Please feel free to have a look at each other tax forward slash events. And we have an in-person event in Portugal at the end of January where you can meet Jeffrey and Keith in person and talk about CBI and, and, and the options there. But Jeffrey, Keith, if someone, if someone wants to reach you right now, they have some burning questions, what's the best way to find you? So we're both on LinkedIn as Keith Isaac, Jeffrey Dovili. You can also shoot us an email. So our law firm, Flosac, Dovili, Thomas, if you were to Google that, you'll find us. Our website is fdt.law for our law firm. For citizenship, it's polariscitizenship.com. If you want to email either of ourselves, for myself, it's Keith at fdt.law, Jeffrey at fdt.law. So any of these emails are, again, LinkedIn. We're always available. We're always happy to have a chat. Ben, sorry, Jeffrey, go. No, I was just saying thanks a lot, Darren, for 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 hosting this event. Um, thanks for having us. It's I can't believe that an hour an hour has already passed. I mean, as I said, you know, some of these topics are really, really interesting, controversial, and 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 I think they they, they warrant ventilation. You know, um, to to sensitize. It's always about being people being conscious about what's going on. Um, so yeah. So thanks again. Really appreciate it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And we will see you next.